Hey guys, welcome back to Delving Into the Cult. This is D. Um, I apologize that I've been a little sketchy the last couple of weeks with my schedule. I've got a lot going on. We're in the process, like I said, of moving. Um, I recently hurt my wrist, so it's kind of put a damper on a lot of things, and we're just, we're trying. But I do want to say thank you because I've been keeping track of the listener numbers and the reception, and... I really appreciate you guys, and I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate you listening. So with that being said, let's just get into today's case, which is the case of Maura Murray. Maura was born on May the 4th, 1982, to Frederick and Laura Murray. She was the fourth of five children. She had two sisters, Kathleen and Julie, and two brothers, Kurt and Fred Jr. She was a junior year nursing student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And on February the 9th, 2004, at 21 years old, something terrible happened on Route 112 in Woodsville, New New Hampshire. And we don't know what. We don't know who was involved, all we know is that Mora has not been seen since. And this is a pretty popular case. There are entire podcast series dedicated to this case. Um, I'm going to get as in-depth as I possibly can in this episode, but obviously there are going to be things that I miss, so I apologize. Um, We're going to talk about her disappearance, what happened before her disappearance, theories, things like that, as usual. Alright, so on February the 9th, she emailed her professors and boss telling them that she was taking a week off due to a family death. This was not true. There was no family death, there was no family emergency. We don't know why she said this, but unfortunately she did. Um... At about 7.30 that night, a woman reported a car wreck on Route 112. And around that same time, a commuter stopped when he saw Mora had had an accident. And he asked if she needed help, and she told him that she had already called for assistance. And that he, she would be fine, he should just, you know, continue on his way. Um... He got home and called 911 anyway because he thought, you know, that she was a young girl, it was dark, it was cold, and he wanted to help. So less than 20 minutes later, in fact it was about 15 minutes later, um, local law enforcement arrived and Laura was gone. So in the span of about 16 minutes, Laura completely vanished. Sorry, not Laura. Mora completely vanished. She, there was no sign. I mean, we, we have no idea. Um, and originally the police believed that Mora may have voluntarily disappeared, but in 2009, the New Hampshire police labeled the case as a suspicious missing persons case. Which, let's be honest, it should have been from the beginning, because all of this is suspicious. Okay, so I'm going to take you through the couple of days before the disappearance, and then we'll talk about what happened on the day of the disappearance. So about four days before um, Maura disappeared, on February the 5th, she... um, talked to Kathleen while Mora was working as a campus security guard. Um, she got off the phone at about 10.30 and she just had a complete meltdown at work. And, you know, she just was sobbing and inconsolable. Um, and her supervisor came to check in on her and she was just completely zoned out. She was just kind of in her own world. So, the supervisor escorted her back to her room around 1.20 a.m. And Mora explained her behavior by saying, and I quote, my sister. Um, and 
we don't necessarily know what that means, but Kathleen was a recovering alcoholic who had been picked up from rehab earlier that day by her fiancé. And her fiancé immediately drove to the liquor store, and of course this upset Kathleen tremendously. As it would anyone that was struggling with any type of addiction, and it was literally being shoved in her face immediately after being out of rehab. Um, and that's all that Maura said was, you know, that something was wrong with her sister, so we don't really know. Um, two days after this, on February the 7th, Fred Sr. came to visit, and he was going to take Maura uh, car shopping for a new car. Um, they went to dinner that night, and then Maura dropped her father off at the hotel and drove off in his new Toyota Corolla. She was going to a party and asked if she could use his car. He obliged. She said, you know, I'm just going to be at the hotel asleep. It's fine. Take it. So she took his car and dropped him off, and around 3.30 a.m. on February the 8th, she struck a guardrail on her father's car. Uh, when the police got there, she explained, you know, that it was her father's car, and they gave her a lift to Fred's hotel room. Fred, you know, was um, upset that his car was messed up, but he wasn't angry with Mora. Accidents happen, and, you know, he told her that it would everything could be worked out, it'd be fine. He was just happy that she was, you know, safe. Um, he dropped her at her dorm room the next morning and called at 11.30 um, that night, so the night of the 8th, to um, agree on a time when they could talk the next day about the accident. They were going to get the insurance paperwork worked out and, you know, work on getting the car fixed. Um, so about 30, 35 minutes after getting off the phone with her father on February the 8th, so that would make it a little after midnight, so early morning, February the 9th, Maura looked up ma uh, maps for the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. Um... So she was on MapQuest, she was printing out, or well, I assume it was MapQuest, it was the early 2000s, that's the only thing that comes to mind. Um, anyway, she was looking up maps for these two particular locations, and it, I believe her family had spent time there before, so she was kind of familiar with, you know, the area she wanted to return there. Um, so now this is the day of her disappearance. At around 1 p.m. on February the 9th, she emailed her boyfriend indicating that she didn't feel like talking to anyone. And uh, just for reference, her and her boyfriend had a long-distance relationship, but they seemed to be, you know, pretty steady, and they talked a lot, and they kept in touch, and they seemed to really care about each other. So it was odd that she didn't feel like talking. Um... And then as soon as she emailed her boyfriend, she called a condo company in Bartlett, New Hampshire, inquiring about renting a condo. And then around 1.13 p.m., she called another nursing student. Um, we don't know what was said, we just know that it was a brief conversation with another student. At 1.24, that's when she sent out her uh, emails to her boss and professors explaining that there had been a family death and she wouldn't be available for a week. Um, and then at 2.05 p.m., she called looking for hotels in Stowe, Vermont. Um, so we've got a lot of locations where she's inquired about staying or visiting. Um, shortly after looking for hotels, at 2.18 p.m., she calls her boyfriend, and she leaves a voicemail saying she talked to him later. Then Mora packed her car with clothes, toiletries, textbooks, and her birth control, 
and she packed all of her room's contents into boxes, and she left her campus around 3.30 p.m. At 3.40, she withdrew $280 from her um, bank account and purchased $40 of alcohol. She went by the police station and picked up the accident forms so that they could get those filled out for the car. And she left Amherst around 3.50. At 4.37, she checked her voicemail. And this is kind of the last thing that we can confirm Mora did was at 4.37 p.m. when she checked her voicemail. Now, if you'll remember, uh, the accident happened around 7.30, so less than three hours later, this accident happened. Witnesses to the accident claimed to have seen a man smoking a cigarette in Mora's car. Uh, there were wine stains found in the car, her debit card, credit cards, and phone were gone, as was some of the liquor. But everything else was there. Okay, so that's what happened the couple of days before and the day of the accident. Alright, so let's fast forward to after the accident. From uh, around 8 to 8.30, a... Uh, a witness saw a young person on foot four to five miles away from the scene. Um, and if I remember right, Mora was very athletic. I think she had run track and things like that. So, I mean, I guess that's possible. Uh, I don't know how likely it is, but I, I suppose it's possible. Um, and at the scene, a rag was discovered in the muffler of her car. And Fred explains this as he told her if she were ever in a snowstorm or anything, if she would put that in her muffler, that uh, snow would not get inside her car. I don't know how true that is, uh, but that's how he explained that. There was a huge search conducted, and there was a ton of media coverage. And unfortunately, it didn't lead to anything. Um... It, you know, and I mean, the theories here are obvious, you know, that she was abducted or that she ran away. And going further into those, um, there's a possibility that she had either a drug or alcohol problem or she'd had a mental break, um, just because of the erratic behavior, um, that she had been presenting previously. Um, and she could have also been in trouble because she had previously stolen a credit card and used it and gotten caught. Um, so she could have thought she was in some type of trouble. I don't know. Um, my conclusion on this one is iffy because while there is a lot of evidence that she was having mental and emotional distress, there's also a lot of evidence that points to me that there was foul play. That someone could have come by and taken her or someone that could have been with her took her somewhere. Um, but like I said, there was a large search conducted and they never found her body. They never found uh, signs of a struggle. So I don't know. I don't, I don't have answers for this one. I don't even really have a speculation at this point. Um, let me know what you think. The links, as always, will be beneath the podcast and the video when I get the video up. Sorry about that. It's been a hectic time around here. Um, so yeah, that's all I've got for you guys this week. And this case, to me, the first time I heard it, blew my mind because I was like, this is a fairly recent case as far as, you know, Unsolved Mysteries goes. Um, this happened in 2004, so 15 years ago. And we aren't any closer to solving the case now than we were 15 years ago. And that just blows my mind. Uh, so that's my two cents about the case. Uh, so, yeah, let me know what you think.